in conjunction with a recent exhibition at Chinese Culture Center this year, uh, we published an anthology called Cheers to Muses. The exhibition and anthology uh, have the same title. Uh, tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce some of the writers uh, from this book. And uh, for, I'll give you an introduction of each of them uh, as I introduce them for their speaking turn. Um, first up, we have uh, Debbie Yi. Debbie Yi is an attorney, poet, and avid supporter and organizer of the nonprofit Asian American Arts in the Asian American Arts Community. She's received her undergraduate and law degrees from UC Berkeley and Bolt. Uh, born and raised in Sacramento, California. She continues to call Northern California her home and now lives in San Francisco. So with that, I'd like to introduce Debbie Yee as our first speaker. So this is called Jasper John's Flag. I have an idea of how the fifth star was killed, dear empire. Not by a burst of gunfire at close range, not in the study with the pen knife, not pierced by the umbrella, crushed by the revolving door. Not jostled or hemorrhaged, the marrow drained. We caught the junction of the tar and the bullet. We came to the body, the encaustic, encaustic casement of skin. Rigor mortis framed the open mouth scream. Wail for your mother, dear empire. Wrap our sons in silken ribbons and a galaxy. Puncture the wound with a score of wahoos upon the mast. The cause has been perpetrated. We are adrift on a barren sea. The fleet diminishes me, he diminishes me. Who shouts for us now, dear empire? This next one is um, a postcard for some reason that I kept of Harold's Club in Reno, Nevada. And I don't know if it still exists, but it's a really old postcard. But Harold's Club, of course, made me think of Harold and the Purple Crayon, which is the children's book of uh, my childhood. Harold's Club, Reno, Nevada. Who would figure, let loose the boy, his purple crayon, let him wild all the way west, let him concoct the loosest slots and women, let loose his imagination, let it begin with M's up high as seagulls, or, or the reverse, low-slung W's topped with bold dot centers, the rudiments of the bosom, and life itself. Pen and ink. In the way we demonstrate speech by quotation marks, the illustrator captures speed by two lines of the pen, too. The trotting horse quoted at the knees, all four of them. And the Victorian lady side saddled atop him, frozen in place by cross hatch marks to her collared riding coat, brooch cameo, corset punctuated by sudden small quotes to indicate the flounce of her delicate petticoat, aroused into activity by the muscular steed. Unintended garden. Whether worn fencing demarcates the property line between the neighbor's Eden and a less fertile yard that situates each of my mornings. I promise not to water the spring flowering plants that remain as brown stubble on the chins of my terrain. I leave for the rains to take care of dried foliage and feral cats. I let the Japanese maple swat away the aphids on its own. Nevertheless, purple spotted brush poke through plywood boards. Two calla lilies take root. Birds return, whistling to lost mates today and all days, until dusk beckons them to come, come back to the nest and try again in the morning. This next poem is actually in the anthology, Cheers to Muses. And uh, it's about Cody's books, which of course on Telegraph Avenue is no longer in, in existence. The sadness of that. OK, Berkeley, late fall. Um, and this is an homage to Forrest Hamer, actually, who's a Bay Area poet. And he wrote a uh, poem called Berkeley Late Spring, which also related to Cody's books. So this is Berkeley Late Fall. I'd been browsing the poetry section at Cody's. 
had come in to lose the unconcerned but persistent rain that followed me in any way as a trail of damp shoe prints and dripping shoes. What company to a careful solitude. I ran my right index finger across each thin spine, flesh undulating across volume and groove, adjusted my posture at alphabetic intervals. Imagine the bookseller coming by to fold and flatten me down into some oblong shape, shape and reshelve me, sliding face first, eyes closed into a murky sandwich between the T's and the V's, stacked up against the unexpected, the unknown. And I noticed that the poems I imagined crowding around you were a populace of the unquieted, the unrequited, distant citizens far from the restful disposition of the safety of S's, the determinate D's, resultant R's, where the poems are, navigable, are the make-believe kind, their worlds navigable, edgeless, unlike the bumpy, organic one I find myself wandering into. This one's about the moon, Mabel and Laureen. The moon regrets his father's advice, take the night shift. <laughs> Each evening, he dresses his luminous forehead in linseed oil, drying powders, the expanse of him bulging with reflection. On his time, it is always difficult to get some shut-eye the hours before, how the sun shines so brightly, how there is no curtain wide enough to screen its beating rays. He takes out his bag lunch, night in, night out, mouthfuls of apple juice and PB&J, the sweetest lunch he has learned to make. Some consolation. On his watch, dog carts, diners are darkened, empty. We are not open for you, moon, they seem to say. And so say the surly cart vendors, the waitresses, like Mabel, like Laureen. How Mabel, Laureen, stroll past him, full-skirted, primped merrily this beautiful moonlit evening, arms in other men's arms. Um, this next one is, a, a, the next two, which are my last two, are um, something about passing. Among us. In the sunken spring, as in winter, as in fall, and in every season that our teacups brim with sorrow and jubilation, our fumbling, fragile hearts are as children grasping their drink tumblers, spilled and milky. Sweet fingertips reach for the infinite optimism of the, night, of the stars and night clouds, hopeful that we, that we might give respite to our liquid, puddly organs, our earthbound regrets. We ask in each story hour, or wonder in the moments when we catch ourselves merely breathing, where our beloved go after they have nestled as memories in the warm chambers of the living. We imagine how they might while away our earthly measure of days, playing gin rummy with someone else's grandmother, or thumb wrestling with the angels who, with their delicate porcelain thumbs, are no match for our lovers and sons. They waltz with long forgotten contessas, ladies of historical footnotes. They telescope the heavens and, then, and an opal moon on Copernicus's coattails. Perhaps these are gauzy dreams, dressings wrapped around wounds and sore spots, pounding out quiet inner drumbeats, while we traverse the terrain in gravity boots, along a curvature and grade, warmed by a distant sun, our inner spaces dusted with the enchantments of what love has left us. And this last one is a recent one called Tile. Consider the corn's ear, a tiling of pale yellow pillows, tiny. Or hexagonal pearls in the manner of a beehive, addressed on the bathroom floor in that certain era of home decor for a deco soul. Warily, I flip through a 12-month calendar, each tile numbered, each 30 or so, each sheet of the dozen, passing passing. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nancy Hom. Nancy is an artist, writer, children's book illustrator, curator, and arts administrator. She has devoted her artistic career to the nonprofit art sector, creating images for numerous political, social, and community events and causes. Her writing has been published in several anthologies. And with that, I introduce Nancy Hom. Thank you all for coming. 
This one is called Bread and Soup. Beneath the bare bulb, we gather to eat our evening meal of bread and soup. Here behind the mission walls, the kind priest speaks to us in euphemisms. He avoids staring at our brown roasted faces, our hard-boiled hands, our violet veins. He mouths his words like a fish, careful not to mention China to us, who are now fatherless and motherless in this new country. He does not know that we have created our own miracle that has transformed the stale, hard crust into crisp, crackling pork skin, the zucchini soup into the finest winter melon broth. Our lips, puckered by pungent memories, smack in satisfaction at this, our only taste of home. This piece is on Angel Island. Um, the Angel Island Immigration Station was where the Chinese and other immigrants were detained and interrogated from 1910 to 1940 before they were allowed into America. And many adopted false identities in order to escape the strict exclusion acts. On morning strolls to Mountain Lake Park, my wife of 50 years stays a step behind. She needs my arm for balance, but avoids my touch. Carefully, she counts the 10 signposts, five stop signs, two mailboxes to our destination. She moves her lips as if remembering. Before I came here, I had a name. Four palm trees faced us when we landed. And they loomed before us like guardians. To pass the Golden Gate, we told them what they wanted to hear. On this island of desperate dreams, we shed our skins and wore new ones. We burned our parents' names and let our past curl into smoke. No longer my father's daughter. No longer my husband's wife. Only the seagulls know who I really am. For months, we were held in separate rooms. The dampness seeped through the bunks and gnawed our bones. At night, the wails of ghosts kept us awake. We colluded our answers. 32 steps to my father's house, four windows facing north. 24 steps to my uncle's house, two doors facing south. I have three sisters, two brothers, four cousins on my father's side. Now I store the memory in a drawer, along with bitter herbs and rhinoceros horns. We dine at restaurants on the better side of town, with pink tablecloths and real flowers in the vases. We hardly go to Chinatown. Before I came here, I held his hand. Now my heart is a Chinese box of riddles. No one understands. I brew hot soup for her on foggy nights. She trims the ends of my thinning hair. Still, she can't forget that day she faced the interrogation officers and said she was my sister. I have not told anyone. We move like shadows in a haze of secrets and lies. Now stairs fascinate her. She knows the neighbor's house by heart. 21 steps to the door, nine windows, one and a half bathrooms. She counts every time we visit just to make sure, in case one day she has to know. Before I came here, I had a name. Shifts of wind, 
softly sighs the swaying trees in the sacred place stilled by time. We toil beneath the deep brown earth, crumbs passed from ant to ant in orderly procession, surrounded by crushed newborn grass and flattened flowers. Many of us have died here. Whose secrets locked above we do not know, nor the shift of wind, the sudden weight that blocked the sun, changed our well-worn course and brought with it the endless night. We only know the passing of formless clouds, old paths forged, forced to forge anew since the coming of the black rain. Number two. There are secrets here not ever known. We only carry the sudden weight of memories, knotted hairpins, green tea mochi, rice balls wrapped in silken cloth, melted crayons, moths, and marbles, cranes flightless wings in a plain brown bag. They are safe inside us. Neither shift of wind nor sun's cruel wrath can force us from our charge. Into the endless night we stand our ground, monolithic protectors of the broken spirit. Three. There was a place, sacred, beaten by time. I remember the newborn grass trampled beneath the earth. No one else should die here. There was a flash, no, two, secrets locked in a fireball. The shift of wind, the sudden weight of blue heat, formless days, worn paths, changed since the coming of endless night. And my last poem speaks to um, world events. And now I'm also thinking about the um, atrocities in Burma. So it's called The World I Leave You. Once there were two towers, then there were none. I searched among the rubble for bones of wiser men. What kind of world I leave you? What's human left of race? What more can I give you to resurrect your faith? Smiles I give and laughter like rain, flakes of snow that gently splay against the window pane. A slit of light transformed to rainbow, sweat from a dancer's brow. Giggles of rivers running down mountains, flowers unfolding to face the sky. Pain from shrapnel's stinging path, pus from festered wounds, blood from soldiers' punctured heart, stillborns pushed from aching wounds. This too belongs to you. Tempestuous world of grit and dirt and miracles reborn, sweetness made sweeter by bitter, sun and shadow forged as one. Once there were two towers, then there were none. Between the once and the then lay all the hopes and fears of men. This is the world I leave you, ripe and full as a mother's breast, a baby's licking tongue, grasping hand, and glistened eyes. Thank you. Our next reader is Roshni. Uh, Roshni has lived, studied, and worked in India, Pakistan, Lebanon, uh, the United States, and Mexico. She is the editor of Living in America, Poetry and Fiction by South Asian American Writers, and Encounter People of Asian Descent in the Americas. Her novel, Braided Tongue, was published in 2003, so I now introduce Roshni. I'm 
reading a selection from a longer narrative, memory is no longer confused. It has a homeland from a poem by the late Aga Shahid Ali. Sometimes the circle breaks and the woman meets the child face to face, each one seeing for the first time her strength in the other, a poem by Jenny Lynn. Dolls and Bombs. After more than a year of emails and phone conversations, Amy Ling and I met at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. It was sometime during the mid-1980s. Calcutta was very hot, said Amy. <clears throat> I wondered how our conversation about Asian American literature had veered into Calcutta. Calcutta was very hot, but I also got my first doll there. We spent some time in Calcutta when we fled China on our way to the States. The doll didn't look like me. She was an English doll, light brown hair, blue eyes, bought in Calcutta. She comforted me in India and in America whenever I remembered the terrible sounds of the Japanese bombs that had forced us to leave our home. Did you have a doll, Roshni? An Indian doll? to comfort you when you were a child. I told Amy about my doll named Shanti, and also about my oldest paternal uncle, who was said to resemble our Chinese ancestors. My uncle was an astounding musician. He played the violin and the cello. I would crouch outside the closed door of his small room clutching the various pieces of Shanti, listening to my uncle's music. I would pick up Shanti's head and place her ear on the door because her ears were much smaller than my ears. I wanted her to listen carefully to the wondrous sounds. I may have known in the way children know that my uncle's music would disappear from my life far too soon. He died when he was barely 40 years old. I tried to tell Amy how my grandmother asked everyone why no one could bring her oldest son back to life even after we had made such great progress in medical science. But in the end, what broke my grandmother's heart was that her two daughters couldn't come to Karachi for their brother's funeral. And when it was explained to her that my aunts, who lived in India, and we, who lived in Pakistan, were now considered enemy aliens, she looked at us as if we were all inmates of an insane asylum. But we are brothers and sisters. All of them are my children, she said, and went off to grieve in the privacy of her prayers. We were quiet for some time, Amy and I, both of us trying to move away from the fearful sounds of bombs and the sounds of grief that accompany, accompany the tearing apart of people, one from the other. Amy broke our silence abruptly. Roshni, what do you mean pieces of your doll? I had three dolls. All three ended up being named Shanti. All three dolls were made of some brittle plastic-like material we call kachakra. I haven't been able to find the English word for it. They were hollow, and the different parts of their bodies were hooked together with what seemed like rubber bands. Whatever held those three avatars of paws together, they always broke within a few weeks, and the dolls continued to exist in their separate components. I suspect one of my male cousins as the deconstructor of the dolls. The grown-ups always promised to reconstruct them, but in the way of most grown-ups, they didn't have the time to follow up on their promises, or they forgot that I was carrying around parts of dolls, except one aunt. She screamed every time she saw me carrying the three sets of legs and arms, the three heads, and the three torsos piled together in the rickety doll's carriage I pushed around the house and the courtyard. To assure my screaming aunt that the dolls were really doing quite well, I would take out all the parts and reassemble them, 
mixing and matching the different parts of the different dolls. Maybe it was a child's way of remembering the acts and the passion of Isis in search of her fragmented husband, and the passion of Ereshkigal tearing apart and then putting together her colonizing bright sister, Inanna. I still love dolls, I collect them. What about you, asked Amy. She was disappointed when I told her that I hadn't cared for dolls since I was in my early teens. In the late 1990s, a friend wanted to give me a custom-made doll. She asked me what kind of a doll I would like. I thought of Amy and requested a Chinese young girl doll. And with my friend's permission, I gave Amy the exquisite doll. The last time I saw the doll was in a collection of dolls arranged with great care in the house by the lake in Madison, where Amy Ling's memorial was held in 1999. Last year, nearly seven years after Amy's death, I saw an old Zapotec woman selling dolls right in front of the terrifyingly young federales blocking the entrance to the Zocalo and the conflict-torn town of Oaxaca in the winter of 2006. And I thought of Amy and her passion for justice and her love of dolls. Later that evening, I thought of Amy again. I found my friend Chenta sitting in the dining room at the dining room table watching the television news about Iraq. She was clutching one of the most grotesque dolls I have ever seen. The doll was about 10 inches tall and thinner than the models dying of anorexia. She was dressed in some kind of a long gown, of course, blonde hair and green eyes. If one can imagine a bizarre version of a beyond bizarre Barbie, that doll was it. Chenta had just returned from the 15th birthday celebration of the daughters of some friends of the family, and the doll was part of the souvenir package given to all the female guests irrespective about their age. Everyone was given that doll. I was about to make a joke about that doll when I realized that 53-year-old Chenta was holding on to that doll as if it was some kind of a talisman. She turned off the television and said, I hope I never have to eat squirrel meat again. Oaxaca is one of the poorest states in Mexico. Chenta was born in the mountains of Oaxaca in one of the poorest of poor Mistec villages. When she was five years old, her beloved father died and her uncle gave her to a family that owned a small ranch and now owns a Casa de Huespedes. I wasn't surprised that at one time Chenta had eaten squirrel meat, but I wondered what had brought up the squirrel meat that evening. Chenta began to rock the small doll and told me the following story. When she was about four years old or maybe younger, Chenta found out that there were dolls in the world. Apparently, her father told her about how some of the girls in the city of Oaxaca had little make-believe babies. Chenta wanted a doll. Her parents laughed and shook their head. Her favorite brother went into the mountains, caught the biggest squirrel he could find, killed it, cleaned out all the meat to give to his mother to cook, stuffed the clean squirrel skin with dried grass and stitched it up. He presented the squirrel to Chenta as her make-believe baby. Chenta loved her brother's gift, but could never eat squirrel meat again. Just as she stopped speaking, the sound of loud bombs went off. We both jumped. Last winter, whenever we heard loud noises, we wondered if they were bombs or fireworks set off for a celebration, or if they were professional and or homemade rockets being exchanged between demonstrators and the federales. Chenta put her doll against her shoulder and began patting the doll's back in the universal gesture of burping the baby. 
Her last words to me that night of bombs and television news from Asia were, does anyone know how many babies and children have been killed in Iraq? How many children and babies are being called killed or thrown out of their homes all over the world? Why does everyone want us, the indigenous people of the world, as if we are garbage to be thrown away? Amy and Chenta, dolls, tears, fireworks, and bombs. When I had told Amy at yet another conference in Madison that the first time I saw the Statue of Liberty, I thought the statue was a huge, white, unbreakable doll. Amy said that her memory of the Statue of Liberty was of her little brother crying as they approached New York. What will happen to us now, he sobbed. If the people here do not like us, where will we go? We have nowhere to go. Will they throw us back into the big sea? We don't have a home anymore, anywhere. Memory does have a homeland. It appeared to me once in the memory of a phone call, a Yamada of bright flame from Amy. Before I could even say, how are you, Amy? Amy said, listen, a wonderful thing happened while I was at a conference in Japan last month. I was walking with a Japanese woman my age, talking about literature and such things, when she'd stopped, turned to me and said, I wish to apologize to you for what we did to your motherland, China, and I apologize personally to you. Amy was laughing gently when she said, a burden of anger and fear and bitterness disappeared from my life, from my very body when my new friend spoke to me, when she acknowledged my childhood grief and offered in my adult life hope in the form of an apology. Thank you. Our next uh, reader is Grace Ilagan Angel. She is a painter and poet and photographer. Married with two beautiful and artistic girls, she is an event planner and arts fundraiser. Her works have been exhibited in the Bay Area and internationally. She is currently working on a collection of poems entitled From a Fanatic Heart. Grace? The first two poems are um, written at a time when I'd say was sort of my hungry period. <laughs> the first one's called Bones. My bones are bleached white under your stare. While you warm your hands over my open wound, I swallow the air that you exhale and pluck the bones from your rib cage, and I will make a man out of you. My bones have memorized the weight of your sins. They are brittle with forgiveness. My thighs unfold as you press the palm of your hand against my curving spine and plant your bones inside my garden. This one's called Drought. This is actually the one in the anthology. He smoothed the wrinkles on my belly and sucked my bitter fruit. We plowed an ocean in my navel and sowed mountains of regret into fields. We sank our roots deeper into the dirt and allowed only the memory of water to sustain our thirst. We dreamt of rain and quietly listened for our trees to bear fruit. Now the next series is sort of same thing, kind of inspired by my mother, <laughs> aren't we all? <laughs> um, this one's called Garden. The gate to my mother's garden open always, where trees flirt with their shadows and the grass whispers my name, where bougainvillea seeds asleep in their flowered boxes pray for rain. I open always the gate to my mother's garden. I will plant my thumb in a clay pot, an offering to jealous gods. I will stretch out my arms like branches, bearing fruits of forgiveness. 
This one was sort of inspired by my mother who always likes to sew. And it's, she's always had this old Singer sewing machine. And I bought her a new one, but she never uses it. It's always that old Singer old one that she always uses. This one's called Cloth. Her cracked lips clenched to thread a dulling needle. The folds of my mother's dress are sewn with bloodied hands. Her hemlines lined with tattered promises, with buttonholes filled with bottomless dreams. Her, her sleeves held up with borrowed strength. She asked, when will I have a home? One day, I uttered quietly, I will plant some pagitas, ilang ilang around my house, she said. Green ivy will grow along its walls and our cat will lay on the grass dreaming of snow. My mother's dress lies folded in a suitcase. Moths slowly devour the fabric, quietly releasing my mother's scent. Caught in the decaying cloth. Sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, this piece was sort of inspired by. Um, you know, what happens to people during the war. And the war affects not only people that are in the middle of the war, but generations thereafter. And this piece is called Ningas Kugon. And Ningas, which, which means um, flash fire, and Kugon is a wild, sharp blades of grass that grows all over the Philippines. The room was soaked with the fragrance of overripe mangoes. My mind is buzzing with flies. In the other room, my mother is mumbling and crying in her sleep. Every night, she dreams of the young American soldier, the prisoner of war she had seen as a child in the Philippines. He was a blue-eyed giant towering over the Japanese soldiers who paraded him in the town plaza. His khaki uniform was torn and stained with a mixture of dried blood and mud. The faded white name tag across his shirt read, Private D. Paxton. The soldiers marched him down to the river and made him kneel by the coconut trees on the river banks. The Japanese soldier, soldier so the Japanese officer, drew his long sword from its sheath, dipped it in the running water beside him, swung it high above the prisoner's head, and within one clean swoop, cut the American's head off. Seconds before the blade hit him, the American shouted something. Perhaps it was his mother's name, or a lover he had back home. Maybe it was the name of his god that he called out, but it did not matter. His head turned circles in the air before landing with a small thud on the, small, on the soft, muddy banks of the river. My mother opened her mouth and tried to scream as the head rolled past her feet. On the far hills, bright red sparks littered the dark skies like fireflies swimming in a blackened pool. The crackling of the burning dry grass hissed at the quiet country night. Ningas Kugon, my mother whispered. In the last stages of the Second World War, the retreating Japanese army would burn the dry Kugon grass to drive out guerrillas waiting in ambush. My mother's family came upon these burnt out fields and found the body of a dog still smoking from the fire. Its crisp tongue was sticking out of its charred skull. As they walked away, my mother heard it whine. It's only the wind, my grandmother told her. But the clouds above stood still. There was no wind that day. It is almost dawn. She is quiet now. Mother, I said, stroking her hair and forehead. 
She opens her, ha- her eyes and for a moment greets me with a blank stare as if I was part of the nightmare. But she smiles and the past restores itself. I kept you up again, my mother said. No, it was the heat, I answered softly, inhaling deeply the fragrance of overripe mangoes that drifted in from the orchard and bowed my head to the mercy of the flies. My last piece <clears throat> is about um, what it was like, what, what, what it might feel like to be dead. <laughs> I was diagnosed with breast cancer about a year and a half, ag- a year ago, and luckily I'm still here. So, but there were many sleepless nights when I thought, what would it be like to be dead? So, <sighs> the dead listen with their eyes Their voices, heavy with regret, drop like rain on deaf pavements where children listen and trace their shadow. They dance, memorize steps on wooden stairways. They sleep with their eyes open wide like the tide, dreaming of half-eaten cake, cigarettes left burning, the low static hum of a car radio. the feel of water, the taste of skin. Thank you. Closing out our evening of readers is Anhua Ting Nguyen, who has received her MFA in creative writing at Mills College, where she was awarded the Mary Merritt Henry Prize in Poetry and the Ardella Mills Literary Composition Prize in Creative Nonfiction. Her work has been published in several anthologies, including Our Cheers to Muses. Uh, in addition to writing and performing, Anhua creates self-published and handbound artist books and is a photographer and printmaker. She is the founder of Pomelo Press and lives and creates in Oakland. And I'd like to introduce Anhua. Flesh of my flesh, for Grace Paley. The woman who invented, the person who invented clothes was a woman. She knew the power of a well-placed leaf. (laughs) Knew there was no looking back. Once man laid himself upon her, he would cleave into her, knead the clay of her. She knew then she would always need a sheath, a shield from shame, the early pain of having been divided. First sin, forgive me for coveting my mother's breast until it bled iodine to deceive me. One, six, five. You cried when I left for California, you and Ba standing in the driveway, never separate. I didn't expect that from you, wasn't prepared for the weeping that would last until I crossed the state border. When I got to Oakland, my emotions unleashed like a wildfire, and I had no way of putting them out. And they were the kind that combust and destroy you, your security, your shell. It almost killed me, the homesickness the longing, the guilt, and anger that swelled itself into a stone in my throat. 165 days till I see you again. How many days in a semester? How long before I can go home? Sometimes you need to burn everything to begin anew. And here there are no seasons. The deaths are not as severe. The purification not as complete. For years now, I've been holding on to my desire for incineration to let the nature of the sun have its way with me, to feel the green tips of grass force their way through the ashes of earth, the complicated earth that seems so soft at the surface and yet so deep. That is how I feel the hidden layers of hardness, then liquid, then flame. Can anything survive at the core, endure the intensity? Must I always hold people at a distance, 
never let them settle inside me. Mother, there is not enough room for me in your womb anymore. That is why I left, to seek a new home for myself, a place where I could grow again. 160, 165 miles that I cried, 165 times I missed you today, 165 meals that did not satisfy. 165, or 165 was not the number of my dorm room or my first apartment or my last. $165 for a one-way ticket, 651, the area code home. This is a record. Phone rings, a sudden mother tone, asks, what are you eating? How are you getting around? Warns me to lock all the locks on the door. My voice plays over and over, half-truths echoing fragmented Vietnamese, covering up my isolation, my self-inflicted asylum. I don't tell her that the locks have already been locked, the click-click scrape of chain to groove. I don't tell her about my fear. I don't tell her that I can't lock out the sirens, the smut, the smog, paranoia of taxi cabs, the clomping of strangers up five flights of stairs, the tortured baby crying, stench of yeast from the bagel shop below, extremes of heat and fall, the unexpected rain. I don't tell her that suddenly, hearing the weariness of her voice, I can still feel her flannel nightgown wet with my tears that the smell of Pond's cold cream always makes me sad. How I long to wrap my aching arms around her warm belly. Instead, I say, I'm fine, eating gum, taking Subway. I don't tell her that today I wept over a bowl of pho. One hundred degrees Celsius. There is no going back, you and I, like broth clouded by the blood. So this next poem uh, is actually in the Cheers to Muses anthology. It's called A Buddhist Heart, and it's dedicated to Trinti Minh Ha, who is a uh, Vietnamese woman artist, professor, poet, um, composer, you name it, she does it. And I wonder if she bakes, and I, I never asked her, but it um, be interesting. So this one's called um, A Buddhist Heart. Each time I burned my body for you, my heart remained intact. A lotus perfumed and gasoline sacrificed at your feet. I watched the saffron flames engulf me, watched them sear away my skin, crimson flesh of a plum stripped of its peel. Tender and glowing like Mars, I would rise to the sky for you to see me. In those moments, I was your torch, and we were united. United by the gaze, the scent, the heat, the shudder. For love of another, I'd whisper to myself, faithful in muted pain. My hope, my heart, extinguishing as you stood there, paralyzed each time, like a still camera, unable to look away. Infraction. If my love were smooth and lustrous, would you split me open, then sew me up again? Would you kiss the scar you made of me, name it and claim me like a mountain, bear witness to the holiness where two rocks collide? If my love were red and pure, impenetrable and clear, would you search your whole life destroying me, just to hold me to the light? I promise a reward. I am missing you like rain that slips through fingers, missing you like childhood dreams, mother's milk, the perfect word, lost like an earring underneath the bed of forgotten breaths of pain and pleasure, links of moon that pass with years reflected in glass, the silver scenes behind clasped eyes. If you happen to find my love hidden in the opal of your memory, would you return my uncertainty? 
So my last poem um, I'd like to dedicate to all the people who have ever lost someone that they love. And as Nancy said, that you get to a certain age and people start passing away. And um, it's kind of bizarre when you lose a parent and you realize that you are now a member of some strange society where no one can understand how you feel unless it's happened to them. And um, I just want to say um, this is something that I'd like to share. Inheritance. You were stubborn till the end. I felt your spirit tremor in my hand, your fierce clasp, your gasping, echoing mine. The hospital room was filled with eyes, witnesses that denied me the last thing I wanted from you. To lay curled with you alone once more, to be a girl again and feel the balloon of your belly rise and fall, pat your cheeks soft as apricots, hear your breathing soothe me to sleep. That day I wrapped my arms around the shirts in your closet, still hanging, I felt the width of them fill my grief, felt them hollow in your absence. The wailing never seems to end inside, only tempers like the sea, and sometimes I think I've lost you like a hat, misplaced you in the messiness of my surroundings. You see, your stubbornness was woven into me, woven into the clothes we both wore threadbare until webbed cotton shrouded our skin. Strands that defied wear, we shared their resistance, pushed needles, mending tear after tear. That is how I held on to you, how I sewed myself to your side, a seam raised into a scar at the end. Thank you. Thank you.